On this episode of the After the Time Out podcast, in partner with the IBCA, we sit down with Coach Katrina Merriweather, head women's basketball coach at the University of Cincinnati. We talk to Coach Merriweather about establishing program accountability, taking over your alma mater, establishing off-the-court structures in your program, and more. As always, thank you for listening to the After the Time Out podcast. So as always, we start uh, every episode with what we call the opening tip. So we wanted you just to tell us about how Bearcat basketball is going through the summer and your your workouts now and how your start there has gone. Um, and then the second part is kind of talk about the process and, and what made you return right to Cincinnati and then kind of what we have to look forward to going forward. Yep. Uh, the summer was awesome. I think that um, it was unique because I had the privilege of doing USA basketball. Uh, so my staff, as soon as they got here, I was like, hey, thanks for coming. I'll see you in a couple of weeks. Uh, so I, I think that I'm very fortunate because they were able to step in and it was like I was here. Uh, they handled a lot of the workouts, a lot of practices. Uh, then when I returned, I could tell some things had gotten done. So that was really it was unique for me to be able to do that and give them an opportunity to to shine in my mind, right, without me being there. So uh, kids worked really hard, um, very coachable. Uh, Michelle Clark Hardy did a great job of assembling a, a group of, of really good people, for sure. Um, now, where we are now, we're going into week three. Uh, we took some days off uh, for Labor Day, and so we're just going to get back at it tomorrow, and we're excited about that. Um, in regards to taking a job, mm -hmm. a lot more difficult than people would imagine. I think people thought it was a no-brainer with all the news. Since now it's going to the Big 12, it's back home, it's closer to home, but we have really gotten started in Memphis. And we were embraced so well there by the city, by the alums. So many investments have been made by the administration into the program that we were really excited about turning the corner there. Uh, the reality was it just was too much of an opportunity for me to, to turn down at the end. Um, but it was not a no brainer and not because of anything that's not great about Cincinnati. It just speaks volumes for how Memphis is a basketball city and how well we were treated and embraced there. So we get to, to Cincinnati though, and it's hard for me to even believe I work here. Every time I walk in that building, I still feel like I'm visiting a little bit. Um, it is nostalgic. It is surreal. It, you Anywhere you could think of is exactly how I feel every single day. Uh, I'm happy that we decided to come and that I get to be closer to my family too, which is probably the, the biggest bonus. So you kind of, kind of touched on it, but something Todd and I haven't really spoken to a lot of coaches about is kind of creating standards. And I think a, a testament to you is, yeah, you were away, but it sounds like, you know, things were handled in a right way. And I think that's kind of what standards are about as a head coach is when you're not there, are the things still going the way you want? So kind of, you know, for our other, you know, for our listeners, you know, what are some things that you feel like go into the creating your standards? Kind of how do you kind of decide those? And then on the flip side, maybe what happens when somebody's not meeting those standards consistently? I think that people have to realize it starts with their staff. And you will hear that recruiting is a bloodline, how important scheduling is, and all those things are true. But if you don't have people surrounding you that compliment you in ways, I've got staff members that are great at technology because I'm terrible. Um, I have staff members that bring in new and fresh ideas all the time because, again, not really my strength. <laughs> I'm not overly creative. Um, and, and so when I'm away, when we come together, I should say, to begin with, and we set our mission, vision, our core values, when we sit down and put those things together, I know that they believe in it, the staff does, so that I don't have to be there. I know that whatever it is that we've all decided, because that's the investment they have in our program too, is my staff has a say in everything. So when they are put in a situation, I know they're gonna echo, not just what I say or what I think, but what we all came together collectively and talked about. 
And I think it, it starts there. You can every, I think a lot of coaches, like everybody has standards, expectations, whatever you want to call them. But the thing is, is can you enforce them? consistently are there going to be people around you that are going to say now you know that if you do that Trina's gonna you know blah 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 and then those our our players our young women are like you're right let me just I'm just gonna go to study hall it's much better that way um so I for me it's just always a stab now when people fall short of those standards and I think we do a great job of creating an environment where they know that they're going to be developed and pushed, right? It's not all about hugging on them and loving on them. Sometimes there are some tough moments. And when they know that you care about them, though, they don't really view tough moments as tough moments. They look at that and they say, like, our coaches, like, they care about me as a person. And I know that that's why they're doing this, even though they are irritating me and I don't <laughs> want to talk to them today. I think they know what our intent is. Um, so we do. We hold them accountable. And, and I think they respect that even when they don't like it. And that's how we continue to set and meet standards and expectations. So I wanted to follow a little bit just when you, you were talking and, and right, you having to bring in your new staff. Tell us a little bit about that process. Cause I, I feel like anywhere, high school, wherever, it, you know, college D3, it's tough because you're bringing people in from different backgrounds and, have worked with these set of coaches and these set of coaches. So to kind of come together and, and have those ideas and, you know, you may not perfect, perfectly agree, but mold them into your own. How does that process go for you and your coaching staff? Yeah, I think that initially I have one mainstay. I saw Ashley Barlow uh, was with me since the first day I was the head coach, you know, Abby jump, I coached her. Uh, and when I was an assistant at Wright state, uh, Brina, obviously I've known her for 30 years. This is my sister. Um, uh, AO is Abby's friend. So I've known her, Ryan and I were together at Memphis. Mikhail played for me at Wright State. So like, when you have that, that unity within your staff, it spills over into your team. And, and there's no question that that's one of the reasons that we're able to do what we've done is the kids, we are the example that we expect them to be. So when we bring them in, we tell them our story too. You know, we at one point we didn't know each other well. It's just where we are now. So they learn the importance of building chemistry. They learn the importance of, of just investing in each other. All right. So when we we do those, and you're going to hear people say that they do a lot of team building, and we do. But I mean, we read books, but really, y'all, we just talk. I, I think that you know, I think that that's like the single most important thing. Um, do we go to a movie sometimes, but you can't talk during the movie. So anything that we do or any environment that we create is usually where we can share. So where people feel safe and comfortable, they can be vulnerable. They can say things that they maybe have been judged for previously, knowing that they won't be judged in our space. Um, and I, I guess that's, that's how we handle it. That's where the chemistry starts, right? Where we just feel like we can talk to each other about anything. It won't leave the room. And you don't have to worry about people throwing things in your face later, right? We're, we're just trying to get to know each other so we can come together on the floor too. Uh, I think that's awesome that you have that continuity. I, I always find it interesting when you look at a coach's bio and they get a new job and like the resume is long, you know, I mean, the, the process of you from here and there and coach with this person, you know, a, yeah. a lot of times that that's how, how it goes. So that's, that's awesome. You have that with your staff. Uh, so I wanted to talk about, um, motivating your players and building motivation throughout the season. We all know basketball is a very long season, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's very, it's very long. So what are some ways uh, and ideas you have for, you know, it, it, extrinsic motivation for your, for your team. And then also the intrinsic motivation part throughout the long, the long season and, and the steps that you have to go along the way. I think that in recruiting and when you develop your culture, we talk about intrinsic motivation and that it's the only thing that you're going to have that's ever consistent is what's inside of you. And so some people have it, some don't. Sometimes it, it's just how people are built. Sometimes it's a lack of confidence. And so we say things like, we believe in you until you start believing in yourself. But at some point, you got to come on. <laughs> if you don't believe that you can do these things, then it's going to be really hard for you to be productive and, and to get the results that you want. So I think externally and with their extrinsic motivation, 
we just simply shower them with compliments and confidence. It's not, I'm not a big yeller. It doesn't sound very authoritative. It's kind of screechy. I don't, I don't think it serves its purpose. <laughs> so, um, you know, I was fortunate to be coached by and mentored by some really awesome people that just didn't coach and mentor by yelling and cussing and screaming. Uh, so I don't coach that way. It's not a knock on anybody who does. I think part of being a successful coach is knowing who you are and what you can do. And I can't be that person because that's just not who I am. So it wouldn't come off genuine and kids can see right through that. We all, <laughs> we all know that. Um, so I, I don't know. I, I think that we just, we try to get them to play loved, you know, and, and we think that that's, that's a way for them to in their worst day to know that they can still do their best trying to show up no matter what their best looks like. I'm I'm stealing that phrase. We try to get them to play loved. I that was beautifully <laughs> said. Um, so it, to kind of build off of something Todd was actually talking about, and kind of you were talking about with your assistants, you know, your career, you know, your personal career has obviously grown throughout the years. Whether you know it was an assistant or a grad assistant or a recruiting coordinator or then a head coach at Wright State or Memphis or Cincinnati, and you know you have, we have. Uh, hundreds of young coaches that listen to our show out there that are starting out and and trying to just figure their career out where they want to go what they want to do um so kind of you know how did you yes be a part of a staff you know whether it was one of your stops as an assistant but also kind of promote your own personal growth along the way kind of do those two things at once they are in such a unique place uh, the young people that are coming through this profession, because when we started, there weren't all these positions. So my very first job after being a GA in Cincinnati, which I was really fortunate that Lori, our head coach, kept me on that year because it was a, a tremendous learning year for me, especially with Mike Bradbury, who later became my boss at Wright State. It was, and in my opinion, still is one of the best recruiters in the country. So I literally came up under him. Um <sighs> So my first job was as an assistant coach. So there was no buffer. You know, there was no director of player personnel, no dobo, no <laughs> nothing. So my year at UIC often gets overlooked, but bless Lisa Ray Bush's heart, who's currently at DePaul. Um, I made a lot of mistakes in that first year, you know, and her and Kevin McManaman and Saudia Jones, other two assistants were so gracious with me because I had this reputation for developing relationships because the family, my dad's program had all these amazing players and everybody knew how connected we all were um, and to and with each other. But I didn't know anything about being a coach. <laughs> so Lisa had to teach me how to be one day to day. That's not something I could get as a GA because I was still in school. I was missing stuff. So I, I think that these young people have a much more uh, they have more opportunities, but it's still difficult because they go into, there's no blueprint. Like for us, it was like, be a GA, be a third assistant, be a recruiting coordinator. Like there were these steps and now nobody knows what the steps are. So it, we also didn't have social media. So there was no branding. There was no putting ourselves out there. That was not a part of the strategy to get a job. So this is another obstacle I view it as that some people may think is a benefit, but we didn't have to worry about it. So now these young people are coming into this business and how do people recognize me? How do I get the next job? Well, I, I don't know how popular my opinion is, but my favorite place to be is the place where I am. So I never thought about the next job. When I was at Cincinnati, I didn't think about being a coach at UIC. I was just gonna do the job I had really well and be faithful enough to believe that whatever was for me would be for me. So all these things come and they happen. Y'all bought a house in, in Memphis. I still have it, you know, because I thought I was going to be there because that was the job I had. And so, you know, these young people, I just think that they have another layer to trying to get a job that we didn't have. And, but what I hope for them still is that they just work really hard. They understand the importance of character and integrity which doesn't mean being perfect because I haven't been, a lot of us haven't been, but just owning your stuff and apologizing to the people you need to apologize to and 
then you may be fortunate enough to get a, an opportunity and or a second opportunity like I had. So that, that would be my message to them is just work hard at the job you have and people will recognize it. And I think that's how you get promoted in this profession. All right, good. So let's talk about scheduling a little bit, right? Uh, obviously, with all the conference realignment and moving, that that piece has changed, right? Now you, you got conferences that are giant and you got a lot of darn good teams in, in, in conferences. And um, so what do you look for, uh, you know, to help your team learn from playing some of the top, you know, top teams every year and then you know how do you you balance it with your goals for that year too and your roster and and everything you got going on you know the transition into the big 12 you know I think early on it was easy to say that it w- it's going to be difficult it's going to be this going to be that I think what we have to wrap our minds around is that it, there's a ton of unknowns got no idea got no idea what it's going to look like how it's going to turn out so we have to be overly concerned with running our own race, with not being worried about long-term anything. We are trying to win the day. And even more so than that, win the hour. Let's just win the drill within that practice that day. And then I think that what we'll do is continue to build in a positive way so that when the games come, we can celebrate small victories along the way. Um, It is going to be a lot of fun I enjoy being challenged. And I feel like when I was at Wright State and Horizon League, we had really good coaches. And then we get to Memphis and again, really good coaches. And now in the Big 12, there's going to be coaches that are very tenured, right? People who have been in scenarios I'm going to be in for the first time. They have done it, messed it up, accomplished it, mastered it. And that's who we're going to be competing against in the last two minutes of a game. Uh, And so what I think for us, it just has taken us to a place where we're working as hard as we can, looking at stats and analytics and watch video, you know, from last year. But think about all the coaching changes in the Big 12, all the things that are different. So no matter how much you try to prepare, our reality is that we're just going to have to go in and and work as hard as we can um, and be ready to pivot be ready to uh, to adapt and adjust to whatever gets thrown at us. Hey, I have an interesting follow, and this is something we we spoke to Coach Wright about as well, you know, and for our listeners, as we were talking about conference realignment, I could see a little a little smile, a little laugh from, from Coach as we we're talking to her. But, you know, for the athletes, I think something that Todd and I have talked about and something that might be under-discussed is, you know, at a place like Cincinnati in the Big 12, if you really look geographically, there's really no one around you. Some of your road trips are actual long road trips, whether it's to a BYU, a West Virginia, the multiple schools uh, in Texas, the multiple schools in Oklahoma, you know, that I think there's even a Florida in there as well. Um, you know, how, how do you kind of help your athletes kind of avoid burnout, deal with the travel, also be students and and kind of do all those things behind the scenes that maybe nobody sees. Uh, our take on it is we introduce them to the lives and stories of other people. For example, sure, it, it's going to be tough for us to make those trips, but we're going to charter. What about those teams that don't? So even though our role may be tough, it's not the toughest by far so what we have to have is a no excuse mentality you figure it out and just like we tell them in recruiting you don't get to be one of the three you have to be a great person you have to see the value in education and you have to be a committed basketball player and love to play the game and you don't get to be one of three two or three with the way these scholarships are set up and the way that these this money is set up you have to be all three so we don't uh, there is and I know this now I know this isn't a popular opinion when I say this sometimes I have to elaborate I know it's student athlete but but you don't get to tell me that you can't work out because you have school the same way that you can't tell me you can't take care of school because you had to work out there's enough waking hours in the day for you to do all things 
if you prioritize and you have the time management that you need. And again, we do a great job, in my opinion, of making sure that their time management skills are where they need to be and developed in a lot of different ways. We have something called the Academy within the department that focuses on that stuff. So I know it's tough and I know it's hard. And I don't want to sound like the grandparent who walked to school in, in 10 feet of snow, but we flew commercial. And the day after that game, that was our off day. So we got in at, at one or two. If you had class at three, you had to go. And that was your off day. And then the next day you were right back at it again. So I think things have evolved to where it may seem hard, but trust me, it is, it's <laughs> – it's not as hard as it was, and it's not as hard on women's basketball as it is on some of the other student athletes in these athletic departments. So we're going to we're going to be fine. <laughs> I, I want to follow on that a little bit. Um, I don't know if we've ever talked about this on any episodes, but tell us about the the academic piece, like when you guys are on the road, right? Uh, I'm not haven't looked completely, you know, there's so many games, but uh, you, you're playing what Thursday, Saturdays, Tuesday, you know what I mean? Like something, something like that. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I'm assuming there's going to be trips where maybe you have back to back road games and you're not, you know, maybe it's not feasible to come back to Cincinnati and then turn around and go. Right. Mm -hmm. Um. So how does that academic piece work when and you guys are, you know, on, on the road and, you know, like I coach D3 and even sometimes we're missing, missing a class on a, on a Thursday to go to all the way up to Wisconsin, say Norbert, you know? Well, I think, well, the big 12, us playing on Wednesday, Saturday, they do a great job of being intentional about not playing two back-to-back -back role games right. unless you request it. Now I have requested them because I think it's important that you have as much practice as possible and what things look like later. Uh, so again, if you're in the tournament, then you're going to be away and you're going to be away during school. And it won't be the first time if we had that experience earlier in the season. So one, the resources that student athletes have is unbelievable. I literally in recruiting tell them, sometimes I forget to talk about academics because you have to try not to graduate in 2023 with the amount of people and the amount of help and, and, I mean, it's just unbelievable. Um, so academics to me, if you are organized enough, and again, and your time management is where it's supposed to be, you have plenty of time and plenty of resources in order to get those things organized. And, and I don't think that, the, that I, people think that all of our experiences are the same in all the sports, right? Well, I'm telling you that graduating is the single most important thing to an athletic department. So I'm, it is a safe bet that the majority of the kids that need assistance and resources and academics, they're receiving them. And, and that's how I view it right now. You want to talk about something that's hard. How about the student that has to pay for tutors? How about the student that can't figure out when to get a tutor because they go to class at eight, nine and 10 and then go to a job to pay for school? So what we don't allow in our space is to have tunnel vision about what our life looks like and not understand what other people are doing in order for them to be successful. So I just go back to that no excuses mentality. Like there's enough time and there's enough resources. We can get it figured out and you've got plenty of support. We're going to support you. And so is everyone else in this department. Tell you what, if I had those resources, my GPA would have been a lot better, I think. <laughs> I, I'm telling you, I mean, we're just like, figure it out. Here you go. We're going here. You got to get, go here, figure it out. Right. And, and the part that I think that we, as I mean, as a former athlete, you look at it sometimes and you're thinking, well, look at all the sacrifices. Look at all the sacrifices, right? Well, what you have is structure. So when your day is structured for you, it's a lot easier to stay disciplined and on task. And if what would I have done if at, at, after an 11 o'clock class, I didn't have anything to do for the rest of the day? Yeah, absolutely nothing. Slept, wake up, eat, maybe study, go back to sleep, wake up. I, you know, well, and I don't know that sometimes we understand the benefit in having that, that schedule and that structure. Um, but we do our best to explain that to our young women so that they understand how fortunate they are. 
So we call this uh, halftime adjustments. So I wanted to talk about your your USA basketball a little bit. Um, there's so many good things going on. Uh, you know, I know uh, I think they're in Canada right now doing the three on three, right? I believe, or maybe they just finished this weekend. Um, you know, you got you know the men are doing their FIBA. You know, you were just this summer working with USA basketball. So maybe just uh, you know give our listeners a little bit on that and and how some of the things maybe you you learn and take away when you see these tremendous international players and and tremendous players in our country and how when they all come together and coaches for that matter there's so many good coaches in the yeah. USA basketball program mm-hmm. whenever you get an opportunity to work with USA basketball you take it because you know there are going to be so many things that you can learn. And for me, it starts with watching how USA Basketball is ran. It is a fine-tuned machine. The amount of people that are around there, the selflessness of the people that are around there to make sure that everybody is okay and things are running smoothly, it just reminded me of when we are at our best as a staff is when everybody's bought into what they're supposed to do and everybody does it to the highest level. So for me, it starts there, you know, with the people that are involved. Um, Then I meet Cammie, the head coach at Washington State, and Aaron and I had already had some conversations um, because we were, uh, I was a court coach a couple years ago when he was an assistant coach under Corey Close. Um, So then you learn from other coaches. So Meeting Cami and Aaron as coaches, really big deal because they do things differently, of course, and you just learn how they defend ball screens. Uh, Cami runs some great stuff that actually you're going to see us run <laughs> when we start playing in November. Uh, and then there's the exposure to these amazing players, right? And, and you've got Rakia Jackson and Angel Reese. And, I mean, the list goes on and on because there's – just so much talent in that space. And it honestly reminded me of what it was like to to coach club ball, where you grab all these really great players and try to smash them together in a very short amount of time. And then we are competing against people who practiced together for months. It's technically other countries, Olympic teams that we're playing against with a group that has not been together besides the, the couple of weeks. And so, You know, we just, I feel like we learned a lot about what to piece together, how to piece it together. And so the combination of those three things, right, uh, of how uh, USA basketball is ran, uh, spending time with coaches, and then being around players that obviously have a a large amount of commitment and pride, you know, in playing for their country. uh, It's just a very unique experience. And and I think that um, it was well worth it uh, because I was panicked for sure about getting a new job and then being gone for that long. Uh, But like I said before, my staff did a great job. I was very fortunate that uh, our administration was on board with it. And, you know, I would do it 10 times over if I could, because we just take so many things away from it. And and like you mentioned, coaches of other countries, right? Uh, I'm going to run some stuff that we saw when we played Venezuela. You know, and and I don't know that I would have purchased the app and and watched Venezuela play, you know, and so just being there in that space um, just allowed me to to broaden my perspective in a lot of different ways. So as we get in the second half, you know, we usually uh, have a specific topic we want to talk to our guests about. And for you specifically, it's this is, you know, something unique and you're taking over your alma mater and you want to rebuild your alma mater you know, at the division one level. So we kind of wanted to start with you with the base of everything, which is recruiting. You know, when you, when you take over your program and and you sit down with your staff and you're looking to start in recruiting, you know, kind of how do you decide what players you want to bring in? And, and more importantly, obviously talent, but outside of talent, what are you specifically looking for in a player, in a person um, to, to kind of bring them into Cincinnati basketball? I think it's really important, and you may have heard coaches say with the time of of NIL and the portal, that you have to recruit your own players first. And I think that when we got the job, the single most important thing was everyone who was still on the team, they understood there is no 
my kids, not my kids. Like you play here. And and like you said, and I use the word unique a lot because that's how I feel like my journey has been and specifically right now. Um, these are our young women who decided to be Bearcats. And, and that holds a special place in my heart because I'm a Bearcat. And it was important that they knew that we were going to, to ride this thing out. We were going to be in it together. Um, we were going to try to figure out how to make this year the best one that we could. And then there were incoming freshmen who we did not sign that we then had to get them to understand the same thing and feel the same way. So now we're up to 11. And so then we bring in three transfers <laughs> and, um, and uh, we have to mesh all this together. And fortunately, I do believe as a group and a unit, that's one of our strengths. So the recruiting started when I accepted the job and then had to talk to the current roster and signees. And, and then from there, recruiting was slow for me because we had to get a chance to get to know the team we had to know what we needed for the next year. We're still in the COVID season. So we have seniors who have another year of eligibility. So you don't know what that's going to look like. So in my mind, we have two scholarships and that's it for the 2024 class. Um, so you go out and you evaluate the team. Well, now you're recruiting people at this level and they've been developing relationships with coaches the whole time, right? For, for months and for some years. So how do we come in in June and try to sign someone in November, no matter how cool of a place I think Cincinnati is, and we've got Jordan and Big 12 and, and all these amazing things going on. The reality is, is that I think our profession still, even with NIL on the portal, is still relationship-based. So for me, 24 is really, really slow um, because we just have to make sure we sign the, the right people. But when I say right people, I mean, again, you gotta be good in your core. And I think there's this huge misconception sometimes about us and the way we play is we're super aggressive. We rebound, we defend, we're physical, um, that all of a sudden those are the only type of people that we recruit. Nah, I just need you to be that in between the lines. I need you to be that when it's time to practice and compete and play games. But what we're looking for are, are young women who are tough and resilient and I think it's important that people know the difference between that, right? Like, I, I want you to, to love basketball. I want you to be a great student. I want you to be a great person. And then when we get between those lines, it's not that you can't be those things, but then we're talking a completely different skill set, right? Well, we're now we're playing basketball and I need you to, to bump and, and push. And when there's a, a ball in the air, we're going after a rebound. I need two, three efforts. Oh, and I think that sometimes in recruiting, uh, we get put in a box because I get calls, oh, that's your type of kid. And I'm, I always has, I'm like, ah, I don't know that you know what our type of kid is. Because at Wright State, I work for a guy, Mike Radbury, and people used to say he provided a service for women's basketball. And it was because we took players who other people didn't want or had given up on or thought that they weren't good kids or thought they were bad students. And then we took them and we loved on them. And before you know it, they're graduating with 3.0s. The majority of them went to, went to get their master's in graduate school. They are amazing members of society. And yeah, they won a lot of games and some championships. And that what I learned there was that you can do it all. So when we're recruiting, we're talking about who we're looking for. That's what we're looking for. I need a fierce competitor between the lines, but I also need you to be a good person. <laughs> you know, like you don't get to sacrifice being a good person just because you want to go, you know, knock people over during the game. And um, it, it's it's been interesting as I've been a head coach in the last seven years when I hear people say, oh, this is your type of kid. Um, but I do, I just want them to love basketball. And I want them to, to be grateful for the opportunity and the platform. And like we talked about earlier, all the things that you receive simply because you have talent and you've been made some good decisions. So here you are in college, you know, on full scholarship and getting to travel the world and get all this cool gear and all these resources and, and things of that nature. So an, an interesting one. And again, I don't know if we've talked about it too much, but you know, when you're, 
you know, looking at a job and you're thinking about, yes, the staff and the, and the, the student athletes, but, you know, the administration, the facilities, the boosters, um, you know, other things you kind of want to establish kind of your foundation. So maybe for you and then maybe for some coaches out there looking for a job, you know, what advice do you kind of give to kind of get that administrative buy-in and the follow through from kind of maybe those other ancillary pieces uh, to support the program? Yeah, I never dismiss how fortunate and blessed I have been. Uh, when I started off with Bob Grant at Wright State, one of his, his biggest lines was, this is not a win at all cost place. So never have I felt like we had to win championships in order for me to keep my job there. And then lo and behold, we won championships. Because what he cared about was that our student athletes had a tremendous experience. And I know it is hard to say no to a job, right? If somebody wants to hire you, and especially the way pay is, and, and everybody has different priorities. You know, I'm fortunate. It, it's, it's me and, and I have a big family and a couple of dogs, but I'm not responsible to take care of anybody. You know, if I have a spouse with a couple of kids, I think my why may be a little bit different. And so I don't, I don't judge people for why they decide to do what they do. All I know is I've been extremely fortunate because I have not been in a position to accept a job where I wasn't dealing with people whose values were aligned. So when I go to Memphis and I, I'm talking to, to Lauren Ashman and I'm talking to Larry Beach and even the president at the time, uh, Dr. Rudd, student athlete experience was the most important thing to them. They're like, yes, of course we want to compete, but we understand that if you're going to do it, because what the way that I do it is slow. And I know people don't believe that, but it, it really is. Like, I don't go in and say, we're going to sacrifice culture to get the best player we can get. I don't go in and saying, oh, we're going to compromise just so we can win games. We're going to take who we have. We're going to coach them up. We're going to do everything that we can to get them to play above themselves. And before you know it, they're running through a wall for us because they know that we run through one for them. And now we're winning games. So I just have been really, really fortunate because now here we are, Cincinnati, John Cunningham and Maggie McKinley, same way. And then I get here and I meet more people and y'all, they tell me, well, you know, the bigger school is, you know, the less they care, you know, because they got to win games, they got to get results. And here I am blessed to be in this situation because that's not how I feel at all. I still feel like at the center of everything, the student athlete experience is the single most important thing to the people here in charge. So I, I think it's silly for me to say, well, you shouldn't take a job if your morals are not aligned with the administration. I get how few those opportunities are. I will simply just say, I've been very fortunate and blessed that I haven't had to compromise that in the moves that I've been able to make as a head coach. Uh, as you were talking, I was just, you know, thinking like, you know, that's, that's even a great question to ask, especially even in the high school setting, like, you know, to an administrator or whoever's in there, what's most important to you about the basketball program? You know, what do you, what do you want it to look, look like and, and see what their answer? Cause I think that's a good way of judging what's important, what's important to them. Um, So I want, you talked about a little bit uh, style of play, right? Your style of play. Um, But obviously that, that, takes on different shapes based on different factors, you know, for your situation, the players you currently have, right. Um, you know, uh, players you're bringing in, um, skill, skill sets of players. So when you, you came in this summer and you were, you were looking at it and you're, I'm sure you're still trying to, you know, figure some things out, but what did you go through to kind of say, okay, these are my core things I want to do and how we want to play, but also, tweak it to what you had and what, you know, your, your player skill sets. When you take over a program, you have a decision to make. You can say, well, I'm going to start moving in the direction of what I want to do long-term, or you can evaluate your team. And now you have to get this right. And, and I learned very quickly that the ability to evaluate is a, is a skill uh, to look at the team that you have and say, this is what this team can be good at. And then do that. And, and some people choose to set the foundation for what they want to do long term. It is my opinion that the that our young women on our current team deserve the best that we can give them. And then we can transition into what we want to do long term over the next couple of years. 
right? And then now that's just my hope. <laughs> that's that's the plan. We'll we'll see if it works out. So hopefully this ages well in a couple of years. Uh, but <laughs> but uh, everyone knows that I'm a dribble drive coach. Uh, I would argue that there's only a handful of kids on this team that are dribble drive players. And so what we've done now is a hybrid of dribble drive and a little bit of motion because that is what this team can be good at. This team top to bottom is also the, the tallest team that I've ever coached. Well, tall doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to be great rebounders. So we are halfway there because we have size but now it's about developing a mentality so that we could be top 10 in the country and rebounding like we have for the last X amount of years. So I think that the single most important thing is to take a look at what you have and coach the team you have, not the team you want, not the one you wish you had, not the one that you could run this with or that with. And, and that's been our approach. So that's what you're going to see from us offensively is a hybrid of, of dribble drive and, and motion. And then we're going to, have plenty of zone defenses um, just because I think that that's what's best when you're long and rangy and have the size uh, that we do, which is not something that we've done in the past. So you're going to see um, a, a team that looks different, I would say, than the teams that we've had simply because we're adjusting to the, the personnel. I think she just became our best friends, Todd. All I heard was dribble drive and plenty of zone defenses. If she starts talking fast break, her and I are going to be best friends. <laughs> so when we talk about transition and everybody said, well, we, do you play fast? I tell them, we, we play as fast as we can. I'm not going to fling that ball all over the place just so we can say we play fast because we're just going to be taking it out of bounds fast, going other way. Um, so I, we want to, like, of course, we want to push in transition. But I think this current team, in my opinion, has 10 forwards and centers and four guards on it. So we're in a space where it just may not be ideal unless we become great passers in the next couple of weeks that we're going to be able to do a lot of different things in, in transition. So we may have to slow down. Well, you're talking to somebody who coached a team that whose athleticism arguably rivals an SEC team when we were at Wright State. You know, well, I have not had a team that's been that athletic in the backcourt since that team. You know, so it, you just have to you have to adjust to your personnel. And and I don't know that I realized just how athletic we were until we played Arkansas in the NCAA tournament. And I was like, oh, we are really fast. Because I was panicked. I was like, well, how are we going to keep up? Like Arkansas plays in the SEC. They're really fast. Again, this is when I'm at Wright State. And the bottom line was our kids just stepped up and, and played hard and fast too. Now it left us drained to where three days later we could barely walk, <laughs> but we were able to compete in that game. And so it, it just, I've been in a situation where I've been taught some very valuable lessons simply by the staff that I've had in the teams that we've had and the people that we've competed against. So just before we go into our last two segments, something interesting is, you know, at the end of the year or year to year, two years from now, three years from now, when you look back and you assess, let's take out wins and losses from the program. When you're assessing, if you're building in the right direction, if you're going in the right direction, if things are good, going the way you want them to go, how are you going to personally assess that in those moments, maybe where you're not with your staff, you're not with your players, you know, it's the off season, you know, a year from now, two years from now, three years from now, and you're looking back. How are you going to kind of assess like, you know what, this is going in the right direction or maybe this piece is and this piece isn't? Yeah, for me, it, it's always going to be when we ask them at the end of the year about their experience, what their response is. That's what sends me into reflection in the off season because we feel like they have an opportunity to be very honest with us and just how we evaluate them and we push them they're responsible for pushing me to be the best coach I can be too. So in moments, if they feel like there's something that I could have handled differently, I encourage them to, to say that. And those are the moments for me in the off season where I can sit back and say, well, it's really great to hear that they think that we did a great job at this and that they feel like we can be better at this. And then we start putting plans into work to be better at those things 
all the while maintaining what they feel like we did well. Now, from a, a basketball standpoint, I think it's just statistics for us. You know, like we just have a few goals uh, throughout the year. I don't try not to bog them down with a lot of different things. Um, it simply hold our opponent under 60. We try to make more free throws than our opponent attempts. We try to have 12 and under, uh, 12 or less turnovers and be plus 10 rebounding in every single game. Knowing that in the game of averages, you're going to play another really good rebounding team and maybe be equal, which that just means somewhere down the line, you got to get out rebound people by 15 twice then to keep our 10 or uh, plus 10 average. So I think those would probably be the two biggest things are, are the opinions and feedback from our players from the year. And then uh, just evaluating where we are statistically, not just in our league or even nationally, but against other teams. One of the things that we just did was we pulled stats from Cincinnati for the last four years. And then we compared them to last year's stats at Memphis simply to give us perspective, right? Like if you think uh, a Matty Griggs who was a phenomenal three-point shooter we had at Memphis shot a lot of threes and let's go look at how many threes the person that was closest to that shot here at Cincinnati. You know, and so I think we just do just a lot of analysis in regards to making sure we're looking at things the right way. Right, because numbers can can trick you as well as they can give you some answers. So, we just spend a lot of time with those two things. Uh, just however our players believe, feel, and think, um, and then what the numbers are telling us. All right, so we call the segment thirty second timeout. Uh, it's your chance to talk about anything you you want to discuss. Uh, your program, something that's important to you. Uh, pretty much, pretty much any topic. Um, it's very loose 30 seconds. You really have all the time you want. Uh, nobody's telling you a second horn or anything like that. Um, so it, it's, it's, it's your floor to talk about anything you want. The reason that I got into coaching uh, was because I love basketball. And then I got exposed to coaching really young through my dad's program, uh, the Family Inc., uh, and I got some very, very uh, important lessons from some extremely talented players. There was a Naismith that I got to coach um, and some players that played in the Power Five. And the reality is we won a lot, so I fell in love with coaching. And then I got to, to Cincinnati and I saw what the actual job was. And I thought I would be so happy if I got to do this every single day. And then I mentioned Lisa Ray Bush already um, that opportunity she gave me at, at 22 years old to be a division one assistant coach and then Christy who believed in my potential enough to give me an opportunity and we did some really cool things together in in that three-year period and I learned some very valuable lessons there um, to sitting out going back to club ball again and that's where I learned to coach I had to stand up. I got to call timeouts. I got to draw up plays. I figured out what made players tick. Um, and then I get back in under Mike Bradbury. Uh, I don't know if there's anyone in the country that could have got me back in the game like he did. And that is why I got the opportunity from Bob Grant uh, at Wright State that then has put me at Memphis and in a position to be here. So no matter what I accomplish or don't accomplish, I do know that there have been some really amazing people that have given me the opportunity to do what I love. And the one thing that I knew I wanted to do at 19 more than anything in the world. So I'm incredibly grateful for all those people that were in that path for me, for sure. All right. So as Todd likes to say to our guests in the last segment, we call quick hitters. Some of okay. these will have to do with basketball. Some of these will not have to do with basketball. Some of these are just to have a little fun. And sometimes this is where the wheels completely fall off the show. <laughs> okay. So our first one, and we asked Coach Wright this uh, the other day when we spoke to her, we want to know what's a Coach Curry story. A Coach Curry story, when I knew that I would be talking about Christy, I think the one thing that sticks out to me the most is not one particular story. It is when I realized what it meant to recruit at a high level, the way that Christy was in a living room when I was working for her was magic. 
People love her, fell in love with her. Players love her. Like she brought Sharika Wright, who was the Naismith from Texas, all the way to Indiana. I don't know if people understand like the magnitude of that level of recruiting. And then we were able to sign a number one class in the country, a number one player in the country. So for me, like Christy taught me what it looks like to have morals and values and integrity, to be a good person and to still be someone to reckon with in the profession. So it's not just one story, it is how in awe I have always been of what that little lady from all of Louisiana has been able to accomplish without any real shine about who she was as a player, like, right, no big time reputation from that. Just an amazing bloodline from being a coach and, and working at, at La Tech. And um, I don't know, I, and I'm still amazed. Here she is at Alabama taking her team to the NCAA tournament. You know, and she, she's just phenomenal. And, and I don't know that she gets enough credit for being an amazing recruiter and the staying power that she has in this profession. All right, uh, I'm sure, uh you know, being from where you are, there's probably a certain way you have to answer this. Otherwise they might come knocking on your door, but <laughs> a little a skyline chili, yes or no? So yes, yes. But I have to admit, not always. I had a player, uh, Emily Vogel, at Wright State. And every time I would say, kid, we want to go eat, she'd be like, skyline. And now I could picture was all this cheese sitting on top of, of this hot dog, right? And then I went and now I found out they have Chilitos. They have all kind of things that that are amazing. I just thought there was just the Coney dogs. Right. Uh, so I am now Skyline, definitely yes. There we go. Okay, so we got favorite activity to do outside of sports, like take sports out of it. Yeah, it's. Uh, it, I don't know if everybody will be privy to what you've heard during this situation, but it's playing with my dogs. Uh, when I walk in the door and they are so excited to see me, no, whether we won, lost or, or whatever, and they demand that I go outside and run around and throw the ball and wrestle, that is literally my favorite thing to do. Because I don't think about anything else. Doesn't matter what went wrong that day. I got two dogs, Maya and Bailey, who, who make everything okay. The last book you read. Uh, have to be uh, four agreements with the team. Okay. Uh, favorite cheat day food? Ah, so everybody knows I'm crazy about chocolate, and I mean crazy, consume pounds of it a week sometimes. But my favorite, uh, I went on a home visit with Mikhail, who was our director of player development, uh, when I was recruiting her, and her family made a punch bowl cake. And it has cake and whipped cream and strawberry filling and pineapples and strawberries cut up in it. And it is the most delicious dessert I've ever had. So wow. punch bowl. Sounds amazing. Yep. All right. La last one here. Uh, you're going to, you're going to travel somewhere. You got your, your option. Just take oceans or whatever, you know, whatever. Uh, plane, train or boat for your, if you're going to uh, travel. Definitely plane. Definitely playing, but I want to go on a train because I have two, all four of my grandparents are still living and two of them won't fly. And so here in the near future, I would like to get on a train with them. But if it's just me, definitely playing. Coach Merriweather, this was a very fun episode. Um, we really do appreciate your time. I, we had some great, great material that I know the coaches uh, that listen are going to learn from. So thank you for your time today. Oh, thank you. It was good talking to you. Thank you for listening to another episode of the After the Timeout podcast in concert with the Illinois Basketball Coaches Association. Please remember to give us a five-star rating wherever you may listen. For more show content and upcoming episodes, follow us on Twitter at After the Timeout and subscribe to our podcast for upcoming episodes. Thank you for listening.